How many people here, uh, just to get a sense of who all is in the audience, so how many people would say that they are themselves an entrepreneur? Wow, we went straight for like the whole group. Okay, so <laughs> how many people here would say that they view their role as enabling other entrepreneurs? Likewise, okay, so a lot of uh, pro-entrepreneur initiatives that are led by entrepreneurs. Okay, and how many people here would, then I'm gonna get the whole group, I would consider themselves a social innovator. Really? No, that should be every hand in this room. I think everybody is attending a social innovation exchange conference, so that should be everybody. Uh, fantastic. So there's going to be, there's so many entrepreneurs here, I, there's going to be some strong intuition around this, uh, this presentation. Uh, but first, uh, I, a question. Um, so what does it take for a city or region to become and remain a, a hub for, for innovation? Uh, this, uh, this question I should caveat and say that this is, this is very much a question about enabling entrepreneurs. Uh, so I'm glad to hear that there are so many enablers in this room. Uh, but it's also, if you are an entrepreneur and don't view yourself as enabling others, this is also about how do you make the case for changes in the ecosystem you need to be entrepreneurial, to be an innovator, uh, to be a successful social innovator. All right, so what do we talk about when we talk about social innovation, when we talk about cities as hubs for, for innovation? All right, easier question. Let's, uh, we're starting with some of the invisible conditions, but let's, uh, let's start with an easy question. So um, we can all think of the reasons why we move to live in the city that, that we currently live in, or a city that we've lived in in the past. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, you know, how many of you might think, uh, I moved to the city because it would be more efficient, save money, Costs, not as much. More efficient, easier to get around. All right, how many people moved to the city because that's where their friends were? Or that's where they could easily uh, connect with others? And how many, uh, for how many was it because of their career? So it was career mobility, access to jobs, all right, more and more people. And how many people chose their city because of quality of life? They saw, all right, there's a couple of people there. Uh, these, are, these are obviously not mutually exclusive. We, we'll choose to live in a place for a variety of reasons. Uh, and so do businesses and firms that drive innovation. So uh, there are a number of economic reasons that explain why some cities uh, become hubs for innovation and other cities uh, are less so. Uh, in economic terms, we often describe that in terms of the scale economies, the agglomeration economies, the network effects that people experience by connecting with others and sharing information. We also talk about the porous boundaries between firms, so the ability for someone to work in uh, and have uh, accumulate knowledge in one context and then switch to another context. So they might take their private sector acumen into uh, public policy, or they might switch from finance into business, and they spread that knowledge through those porous boundaries. Uh, but lastly, and, and uh, relating back to quality of life, is that some uh, cities become hubs for innovation because they are just great places to live. Uh, we know in the history of Dahlberg, we have uh, now about 15 offices globally, and we've seen that uh, a lot of the offices that have emerged and where we have our best staff located is not just in proximity to our clients, but in cities that we like to work in. Uh, if it was purely clients, we would have an office in Seattle next to the Gates Foundation, but instead we have an office in San Francisco. We had uh, staff that wanted to live in San Francisco and uh, preferred the, the city for you know, various personal reasons. Uh, so geographic competitive advantages, what attracts people to, uh, to cities is quality of life as much as these other more economic factors. Uh, we also know that there are various barriers that limit innovation in other cities. Uh, the, the list is long, uh, and it varies widely by city. Uh, this is a, I listed some of the, the, the challenges that, uh, that, I, that I saw in a project in Afghanistan about a year and a half ago. Uh, the, the list includes a lot of the usual suspects for constraints, so lack of infrastructure, access to capital, uh, human capital and management skills, uh, a reliable ICT, mobility, getting around. Uh, these are all familiar constraints and entrepreneurs in this room will know that better than anybody, the actual implications day to day of experiencing those constraints. Uh, now, one of the key messages here is these are not just barriers that can be removed and then they're gone forever. 
infrastructure needs to be maintained, communities need to be invested in, we need to have uh, continuous attention to these kinds of assets in order to remain hubs for innovation. Uh, and we've seen that past hubs for innovation, this is the Detroit example, uh, can wither over time without attention to uh, their geographic competitive advantages, making their, their cities a great place for people to live and, and so on. Uh, and now recovering from that can be very difficult. Uh, Detroit now struggles to maintain density in its neighborhoods uh, and without density at a, in a neighborhood level and in housing, it's difficult to form social bonds, create organizations and, uh, and associations of producer groups and so on. So innovation is even more difficult to, if it's allowed to depreciate, uh, if these kinds of assets are allowed to depreciate over time. So now uh, let's go to the balcony and, and think for a bit. So we're starting a bit with these invisible conditions in this conference and we'll come back to that tomorrow. Uh, but let's ask ourselves a couple of questions. So first is, can we imagine a, that there's a, a recipe that works across cities? Is it possible to articulate something that works everywhere? And if so, then what questions can we be asking? What can we do in our city to become and remain a hub for innovation? So let's, uh, we're, we're gonna step into the clouds for a couple of minutes and, and, uh, and define, establish some definitions before we, we dive into kind of the more practical, what does this look like? So first, uh, so Dahlberg is a strategy consulting firm. We often distinguish between strategy and implementation. So planning versus doing. And this is, this is a helpful delineation because when we talk about planning to become a hub for innovation, we might do things like a diagnostic assessment. We might want to know what are the strengths of Nairobi, what are the strengths of another city, and we might engage local communities in a participatory process. We might uh, create physical spaces like this one in which people can innovate. And what we know is that uh, these kinds of things in the planning side, uh, they tend to be applicable and relevant across many cities. Uh, we know that the, the costs are often concentrated, but the benefits are diffuse. They have a, a flavor of public good qualities uh, to them. Uh, but in contrast, uh, when we talk about implementing these things or, or actually removing the constraints and in innovation, that varies widely by city. So a constraint on innovation in Kabul or the many constraints is going to be very different than the constraints on innovation in Detroit. And the constraints in Lagos will be different from Nairobi. So, it's uh, what we do to surface those constraints might be similar in different places, but how, what the, the issues are uh, will, of course, be different. So uh, this is worth highlighting because we know that in development, development actors, philanthropies, governments, uh, uh, we, the entrepreneurs, we, we often try to remove these constraints, and those exist in this kind of macro space. These are... Uh, constraints in the enabling environment for, for creating jobs, for achieving growth. And so we talk about issues like uh, you know, large donors funding infrastructure, mobilizing private investment for, uh, 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 for, for physical infrastructure, and then changing public policy and all of these things. But in practice, uh, we know that success really depends on what happens at a lower level. So this is uh, at the micro level, individual entrepreneurs and innovators, we, we don't actually see progress unless we are linking these macro issues, the doing that we do on this macro level, if it's not linked to the day-to-day -day concerns of individuals, then we haven't actually had traction. We, we, we don't get anywhere. So there's a disconnect. We often talk about how public policy is out of touch with the concerns day-to-day -day of entrepreneurs, or we talk about how uh, those efforts are, um, are disconnected. Uh, so we need to figure out how to bridge this gap between the micro and the macro. And uh, this, uh, so there's this kind of missing middle ground or missing meso level uh, where we can better connect this, uh, the big picture with the, the day to day. Now, I, a way of visualizing this, you could think of uh, putting innovators and entrepreneurs at the forefront. So they're really at the center. It's not the donor-led initiative. It's, it's really all of you and the concerns you see and the, the issues that you see limiting your ability to scale up your initiatives and so on. 
Uh, those are, that's ultimately the goal. And you could think of that as being on the top of, uh, of an iceberg, your day-to-day -day concerns. And if we can't connect to those day-to-day -day concerns, then we don't see actual success. Uh, and if we dig underneath that and try to diagnose why aren't we making progress, we find there's a need for this missing meso level of cluster associations, hubs, venture capital networks, um, uh, innovation labs, public-private forums. It's all of these kinds of connective tissue or social infrastructure that make it possible to recognize patterns across the different concerns that innovators face. And if we don't have that connective tissue to see those patterns, then it's very difficult to imagine a policymaker, an investor, a donor, uh, someone working in that enabling environment, how can they actually connect what they do to the concerns that people face? So when we, when we talk about tools, processes, methods for becoming a hub for social innovation, we're really talking about the tools, processes, and methods for recognizing patterns, recognizing across all of you and the entrepreneurs and innovators in various cities, uh, what are the patterns that you see and that the enablers of social innovation can help to address? So let's, let's unpack this a bit. Uh, together we can, we can uh, sense these patterns, but uh, it requires you know, a number of, uh, by, it requires all of us asking some specific questions. So we've laid out just a, a framing to keep in the back of our minds over the next couple of days, uh, four questions that we can bear in mind. So the first is how we diagnose, how do we actually surface the concerns of entrepreneurs and innovators? The second is around how do we design actions or solutions to do something about it? Uh, third is around how do we transact? So how do we pay for those kinds of solutions? Uh, innovative financing, impact investing, and so on. Uh, and then how do we learn over time? So how do we recognize and embrace failure? How do we accumulate knowledge? And how do we spread knowledge from, from, cities to, from city to city? So these are, these are abstract, so let's, let's dig into it a little bit. I'll give some, some examples. Uh, so in, um, uh, in terms of how we diagnose, there are, uh, there are a number of tools available. At, uh, at Dahlberg, uh, our role and the tools that we employ are, it's a consultative process. So we're often engaged by a donor to test or pilot a new initiative. And so over a time-bound uh, period, uh, we will talk to everybody and get a sense of what were the shared concerns and we'll try to articulate an agenda. A good example of this uh, here in Kenya was we were engaged by the uh, Ministry of, um, uh, of um, Industry and Commerce uh, to, to help understand, to define the concept for the new um, Kanza Technology City. So it's in a, an ICT uh, cluster uh, that's being developed in, in the city. And our process was to engage uh, some 300 different uh, uh, actors across public, private, nonprofit sectors uh, and to understand uh, what are concerns of investors, what are concerns of those actors that would need to be addressed for Kanza Technology City to be successful. Uh, but then also, uh, what would be the impact? How inclusive would it be? Would this generate jobs for Kenya? How does this feed into Kenya Vision 2030? Uh, it's a very consultative process. And through that process, we use a number of you know, practical analytical tools to gather the facts and communicate them back. Um, but there are other kinds of tools that one might imagine in this space. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation often develops uh, and has uh, uh, commissioned Dahlberg to help develop tools for uh, gathering information from entrepreneurs on the ground and collating uh, co that evidence so that we can better see what it is that people want in a given place. Social media can play a great role in surfacing these kinds of, uh, this kind of information. Uh, I'll take a, so in, the second question then is around design. So now we, let's say we engage one another, we use these kinds of forums, public, private, or these hub co-locating spaces, and we bring together our shared concerns, we articulate the evidence that we, uh, uh, of what needs to be done, but now we need to do something about it. Uh, now, an interesting uh, innovation that we saw recently, we're working with the uh, 100 Resilient Cities Initiative, uh, which is pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation, and the centerpiece of 100 Resilient Cities is their chief resilience officer role. So it's a, it's a new mayoral 
level cabinet position uh, responsible for strengthening the resilience of the city. And what's really innovative about that position is that it, uh, the, the rule cuts across sectors. So it is not about uh, physical infrastructure or health or education or any of these things. The role was uh, wherever there is a vulnerability in the city, then the chief resilience officer uh, is meant to surface solutions to address that vulnerability. So it's by definition, it's a, it's a mechanism for collaborating across sectors and, and trying to build momentum around solutions for change. Chief resilience officer, the, uh, what's the real innovation was that they created a new uh, role or a new, uh, a new institutional structure in city government uh, to play that kind of uh, uh, collaborative design function. Uh, you can imagine this playing out in a number of other ways. If there was representatives of hubs across cities uh, that were working together to craft proposals or solution concepts that could be fundable uh, by donors or by the private sector, uh, is that, does that role exist today or do we need people to actually wear a hat that says we are responsible for advancing those kinds of proposals? Uh, now, then the third question is, how do we pay for those, those ideas that once they're brought forward? Uh, we, we heard earlier this morning that, I mean, there's a range of innovations in financing, so social impact bonds are a great example of innovations in financing. Uh, but uh, there are lots of other examples and how do we actually pay for this? One question I'm looking forward to asking over the next two days is how, who's paying for the hubs in Nairobi? Are there differences in the business models of the physical uh, uh, co-working spaces that, uh, that we see? Is art different than, uh, than tech, for example? Would energy be different from advocacy? <coughs> How do we pay for these kinds of things? Are there innovations that would allow us to create hubs with different topic areas? Uh, and then the last is, and this is a kind of wrap up point, is learning and sharing. How do we learn and share our knowledge? And this kind of exchange, the social innovation exchange, is a great example of that. Uh, so we are already advancing on that kind of question, but we could still ask, what else could be done? What other mechanisms need to be in place to spread knowledge about what works where? Is it web-based? Do we need laboratories that are linked with one another? Do we need exchanges of students that are spreading cross-pollinating ta talent from one city to, uh, uh, to another, as the uh, Amani Institute, in a way, is, is also uh, championing? Uh, to, uh, and then, uh, or maybe we need a think tank. Do we need an African-centered uh, urban development think tank that looks at how we cultivate social innovation in African cities? Um, these are kinds of questions that we can bounce around with one another over the next two days. And I guess the concluding point is that uh, the key to answering these questions and to having a successful hub generally is diversity. Uh, it ultimately boils down to having a mix of different kinds of perspectives in the same room uh, and addressing these questions together. Uh, so I'm excited and looking forward to hearing from all of you over the next two days uh, as we can generate some big ideas and hopefully start to uh, move the needle. Thank you.